Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi, I'm Peter Bart. I have the, the great pleasure of introducing one of my favorite characters in the journalism world, Bob Mankoff. Bob, I think, has the best of jobs in the whole world of journalism. Because he is, as you know, the cartoon editor of The New Yorker. On the other hand, he, in a sense, has the toughest of jobs, because he must sense all of us nattering into his ear. You know, that, that, that cartoon wasn't really that funny. And, oh, I, I don't get it. What was it supposed to be about? But he seems he's done this for so many years. He dealt, deals beautifully with this subtext of all of us nattering. And, uh, uh, and as you know, there's, there's a book that Bob has written, which would be of keen interest to you. And he's also performed an HBO documentary about the New Yorker and its cartoons. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce a king of cartoons, Rob Mank. Hey, thanks for coming here. It's great. I know you could have chosen a lot of other places, right? You chose the right one. Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you're gonna have a good time. What's up? Is it up there? Oh yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm Bob Mankoff. I'm the cartoon editor of the New Yorker magazine. I also do cartoons, cartoons for the magazine. I founded the Cartoon Bank, which licenses all, all, all the cartoons. So you know we're in this hyper ethical era now, right? I mean, I'm doing cartoons. I'm selecting the cartoons for the magazine, and I'm selling the cards. I mean, <laughs> is there maybe a conflict of interest here? <laughs> so look, I, you have to take these things seriously now. So to, to explore this issue, I've, I've uh, uh, founded a, a blue ribbon committee, <laughs> which is investigating this. This takes, this takes time. You don't want to rush to judgment. <laughs> And also, I think, I, I think I'm going to do okay because I'm heading that committee. <laughs> okay. Here, oh, let's go to the next. Did I do the right one? Okay, now this is cool because if you... Go, 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 go. Why does that load? Oh, okay. So there. So uh, I'm here to talk and to explain humor and sell this book. Now, if you buy the book, you're going to get me, you know, doing, drawing this cartoon. Now, look, if me drawing the cartoon over time makes this book more valuable, <laughs> I would like it back. <laughs> now, I know that all of you are not going to buy the book or read the book, so here, is a very quick summary. <laughs> now the book has a lot of cartoons in it, and it really is a book. I mean, it's a lot of writing in it too. Uh, because I mean, originally when I, I got the contract for the book, and first of all, I'm not a writer, or I'm a writer of very small <laughs> of captions. But I, I uh, you know, I, I, I said, oh, I want, to, I want to write this book. And people said, well, why did you want to write it? And I said, well, for the advance. <laughs> you know, that was really important. And, uh, uh, but then I got into it. And then you know, there was this whole thing of it has to be so many words and everything. And the book, so when I start out, because I mean, I'm really intelligent and funny. Now you've got to write a book. Not like these other people here who are writers who can't help but write. Do you know what I mean? Now it's like I'm, now I'm looking at my word count and the size of the margins. <laughs> it said 40,000 words. Do I get the whole advance if I only do like 27? And, you know? But then I really got into it. And, and, and it's an interesting book. It talks about, I mean, I won't go to that. Here about me growing up and being Jewish in Queens and my mother and Yiddish and this whole, I mean, I really delved, delved into it. Uh, and, uh, it, and it is a memoir, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll diverge from, the, from, the, from this the presentation, which frankly I've given a lot of times and I'm a little bored with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and just to, to say, 
it, it, so, you know, I was writing the book, and I said, well, you know, where, where did I come from? And I became a cartoonist and a cartoon editor, and I, and I started to think about my parents, and by that time, my parents had passed away, my mother Molly and my dad Lou, and they were born on the Lower East Side, right out of Hester Street in 1907 and 1908, and I didn't have a great relationship with my parents, especially my mother. I just wanted to flee, basically, uh, uh, you know, really, that world. Now, of course, I regret that I didn't learn Yiddish or know it, how rich it was, but then, and I wanted to uh, flee it. But, but I, uh, I delved in about, to, about my mom and dad, and I found these letters, uh, uh, from World War II, V-mail, V-mail, victory mail, from, from my dad to my insane mother. <laughs> you know, a typical hysterical Jewish mother. And, 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 and here's the thing, my dad was like cool and rational. He never went to college, but he educated, we're in a library. I may never get to this presentation because I have interest in things that tell me that I'm being stimulated right now. Uh, he, 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 we're in a library and my dad, uh, was born in 1908, and he had to leave school when he was eight because his father died and eventually went to vocational school. But he educated himself in the New York Public Library. If you talk to my father, everyone said, where did he go to college? And how he educated himself, he read the New York Times from cover to cover every day. And honestly, if you did that, you would be uh, an educated person. But I always wondered what attracted my dad, who was so rational and sane, to this insane woman, <laughs> Molly, Molly, God. And so I'm, I'm looking through these old photos. This is as I'm writing the book, and after, after, after my my, uh, uh, my parents had passed away, and and so I, I okay, another little anecdote. In 1994, I started the cartoon bank. There was an article about me in the New York Times. And uh, I get a call. I'm, I'm, I'm not at the. New, I'm a cartoonist for the New Yorker, but I'm not the cartoon editor of the New Yorker. I'm a cartoonist, but I have this company called the Cartoon Bank, which licenses actually all the cartoons in New York for The woman calls me up. Hello, are, are you are you Lou Mankoff's son? And I said, Yeah. Why? Why? How do you? How do you know? She said, Well, I, I saw your picture in the paper, and you look like him. And I said, I look like my mother more, but she doesn't look like him. I said, well, how do you know? Why are you calling me? And she said, your father in 1934 worked for my father in a hardware store in the Bronx, and he went out with my sister, and your mother stole him away. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I said to my mother, my, I said, what, happened? what is the deal? And my mother said, oh, that blonde. <laughs> Anyway, so I, when I go through all these pictures, I find, uh, I find this picture of my mother, and she's on like, it's 1927, and she's like on the, one of these roadster cars from the 20s. She's smoking a cigarette, and her leg is up, and is exposed. I mean, she's hot. And so now I understood, like, what, get, what gets everybody together. <laughs> you know, what, what got them together, because by the time, you know, uh, whatever. And, and so the, the other thing, and in the book I talk about this, so here it is, this email. This is crazy because I'm not even getting to the present. But you look like a good crowd and I'm interested in telling these stories. The, the, so, 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 uh, uh, so, so see the V-mail. V-mail was victory mail. It was photostatted and stuff. And actually when you talk about surveillance, everything was censored. Censored, right? And so here's a letter from, I don't have my mom's letters, I have my dad saying, look honey, I know you like to get mail. Everybody likes to get mail, but we don't have post offices everywhere. We're at war! <laughs> <laughs> he's not saying that, he's trying to explain to my mother why she's not getting as much mail as she wants. But my father also had a nice sense of humor, and he gets to Paris, and he says, in the, in the, he gets to Paris, and he says, I found a very nice handbag uh, here, said, and he says, it's very popular in Paris. I think it's gonna be okay in the Bronx. <laughs> so, so that's wonderful. Okay, so look, the book, the book is called How About Never, is Never Good For You, My Life in Cartoons. It's based on 
Yeah, I mean, I took, I took the title. This is, I've done 950 something cartoons for the New Yorker. The way it works when you're a cartoonist is when people say, oh, I have an idea for a cartoon. <laughs> okay. So I'm at my cardiologist because they have an arrhythmia. This is a good place to go. If you have an arrhythmia, you have a plumber, you know the price of it. <laughs> And, and I'm like hooked up to all the machines, and I'm sitting there in my underwear. And he wants to put me at my ease, so he says, uh, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm the cartoon editor in the New Yorker. So he, all the machines go off. <laughs> he tells me, you know, I have an idea for a cartoon. <laughs> I said, great, I got an idea for a bike now. <laughs> <laughs> so people who have an ideas for cartoons, it's like they have what I call idea rapture, because they haven't ever gotten an idea before. <laughs> and now they're sort of thrilled. <laughs> it's, it's something they haven't experienced before. And of course, it's disorienting, and they actually think it's also a good idea. <laughs> But if you're a professional cartoonist, you do 10, 15 ideas every single week, and you never know which one is there. This is, was a throwaway line. Tina Brown, who was the editor at the time, said, oh, I must have it, and then it got published, and it got reprinted thousands of times. So, the, so what happens, one of the ways you make money through cartoons is they pay you for them. New Yorker pays the best, still hard to make a living, and then they get licensed or reprinted or used again, and so many, many thousands of times. So this one put my daughter through college. <laughs> okay, now it's sort of neat because, so you become, see, I know what's on my, I know what, you know, we'll Q&A afterwards. Okay. We're just, I'm just too old to read from here, the caption. Oh, the caption. I hope you're going to tell I'm, me. I'm going to move you over. <laughs> <laughs> No, we're going to get one of those little Rancho Mirage golf things, so anybody, it's going to be great. Like, if you can't see a caption, we'll all be driving around. But you also look like a lady who might be good on a hoverboard. I think that could be cute. Okay, see that? Okay, so, so I like the fact how brilliantly this was worked out. You got here and here, but not here. Okay, so the caption, now this... So I think we're going to have to go like twice as long here. <laughs> so the caption is, no, really, you, why don't you move over the here where you can see it? Well, no, no. Anyway, so the, the caption is a guy on the phone saying, uh, I know Thursday's out, how about never is never good for you. Uh, the, uh, you know, I'm just going it, to, it's not too much trouble. I'm going to bring this over to you. <laughs> Okay, you know, one of the things, in the HBO documentary, which is great, it's a great documentary called Very Semi-Serious, uh, uh, it's about me and the New Yorker cartoonist. And in the documentary, what I say about being funny is like being awake. And I think most people are sleepwalkers <laughs> to the absurdity of life and the way you get through. And that's why I do what I do, and that's why when I give these talks, I do what I do. I want to be alive. So one way not to be alive would be, and it's a good presentation, just go through the presentation. Do the slide, you know what I mean, instead of have fun. So one of the things is, but having fun and being funny is also enlightening. Anyway, so in the book here, this is, this is the Yale book of quotation. Okay, so I know what's going to be in my obituary, this cartoon. Maybe even on my tombstone. So, so it's great because it says, Robert Mankoff, 1944, that's when I was born, you know, and then it says, it gives the caption, and I'm, you know, I'm along with that other famous humorous Mao Zedong. <laughs> so, so you can do the math. I was 70, now I'm sorry. So here's the three jokes I made about being, about being 70. And, okay. So, so, you know, I'm 70, uh, the good news is, it could be worse, and the bad news is it will be. <laughs> I'm 70, the good news is 70 is the new 50. The bad news is dead is not the new alive.
And when you're 70 and you're a guy, you wake up stiff everywhere but where you want to be. <laughs> Okay, so it became sort of a catchphrase used all over. This was 2008, so everybody uses it now. Uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi said this on the Jon Stewart show. It's on t-shirts, and you can also get it on a thong. <laughs> now, I actually don't, I had a fight. One of the things is, that, like an interesting sidelight is that when a cartoon like this appears in the New Yorker, you have the, you have the copyright. Actually, an interesting thing about the New Yorker is that the cartoonists own the cartoon. They own the original and they own the rights to it. The New Yorker then licenses it back to use it, so that's pretty good. But all you own at that point is that you own the image and the caption as it appears, so people can rip it off. Then you have to go to the copyright you know, and then, so I got the copyright, and you have to go and get the trademark. So I finally got that, and now I'm negotiating with these people, and all they'll give me is more thongs. <laughs> uh, now, the great thing, the neat thing, the wonderful thing about the New Yorker is its ethos, not, for, not only for the articles and everything, but for everything it does. So since 1925, Every single cartoon that appeared in the magazine was not only put in a scrapbook, so put in a scrapbook, and here it is, okay, scrapbook. Robert, so Charles Adams and Peter Arno and all my cartoons, but also in volumes, each and every cartoon is typed out and described in effect keyword. Since 1925, when I started the Cartoon Bank, or they bought it for me actually, Cy Newhouse bought it for me. So there's a little funny story there because we're at the table with Cy Newhouse and they say, well, do you want the money electronically transferred or do you want a check? I want a check. And so they give me the check and I said, can I see some ID? Uh. <laughs> my point, and this is my mantra I say, is leave no joke on jokes. <laughs> you have a joke, so what? Let's say someone's offended. My jokes aren't offensive, but you know, all the things where you thought you said, you wanted to say, you could have said, you should have said, you know, it's woulda, coulda, shoulda. Do it. <laughs> okay, so, got all these volumes, when you're dead, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> okay, here's some of my cartoons. I'm sorry, dear, I wasn't listening. Could you repeat what you said since we've been married? On the one hand, eliminating the middleman would result in lower costs, increased sales, and greater consumer satisfaction. On the other hand, with a middleman. Uh, as a matter of fact, you did call us at a bad time. And while there's no reason yet to panic, I think it's only prudent we make preparations to panic. Uh, this is, oh, a, a billion is a th thousand millions. Why wasn't I informed of this? I don't know, many, maybe there are books here on the financial crisis or whatever you think. I think a lot of this stuff, you know, is made overcomplicated. <laughs> overcomplicated. It's like, you know, for each scandal, it's always like, guys, it's, not, it's, it, it's, it's derivative, it's yeah. complicated, it's math, it involves long division. <laughs> <laughs> but but on, honestly, this is what it involves. This is, act, this is actually what it involves. And it's lots and lots of money, and people don't know what to do with it. Okay, this is more philosophical. There is no justice in the world. There is some justice in the world. The world is just. <laughs> you know, in the introduction, you know, one of the hallmarks of the New Yorker cartoons, and I like to think my cartoons, is there's a cognitive element. You know, it's cognitive. There's something to think about. You're trying to make a point, or it might be a little bit a a ambiguous. So there's more than just a joke. Uh, truthfully, the, most things people think are really funny are just uh, uh, cats on Roombas. <laughs> you know, people falling down to jaunty music. That's what America's Funniest Home Videos is. But the New Yorker's a little bit more than that. Okay, it's called, Now That's Product Placement. <laughs> the New Yorker used to be uh, at the Condé Nast building in Fort Times Square. I used to look out at the Empire State like, that is a good idea. <laughs> this is called Hamlet's Duplex. 
So in my cartoons, you know, there's, you know, there's something to get. Uh, people ask me, how do I get my ideas for cartoons? I say, well, I think of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll skip this because I want to go on. But he, in the book, there's a whole diagram about how I think. This has to do with, I did an article for Psychology Today about the wheel, and said, well, how do you come up with ideas? So originally with these ideas, I just started drawing. And in drawing, it, it, you know, so I made a square wheel and then a round wheel. And then, you know, and then I came up with different ideas. And I could associate 100 ideas to these ideas. I could look at the wheel as transportation. I could think of it as fire. I could, I could I, you know, a lot of, in other words, I could take the wheel and I could have the cavemen trying to roast something on it and saying, OK, this isn't working. Here I said, the, the front part, uh, 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 the back part, I call uh, the wheel, the front part, the brake. The, so part of the book and part of humor is like a petri dish for creativity. In other words, you can see the ideas move, but it, 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 so the thing about jokes, and I think creativity in general is, ideas don't get used up. They don't get used up. They create ideas. If I wanted to, I could just sit down for a month and create a thousand uh, you know, ideas uh, 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 like this. So in the book I talk about, and I wrote a book about creativity as it relates to humor. Okay, this is, I use this diagram really to show that in the book, that nothing comes from nothing. Okay, so here, because I can't see it here, I did a cartoon on the right there, relax, honey, change is good. <laughs> okay, when, when, oh, sorry, I'll go back one. Okay, so here are all other, to be creative, I talked with uh, Peace Heller, uh, novel, we talked earlier, to be creative, you have to immerse yourself in a domain. Now, there's, there's big domains, and there's a little domain like, like the Grim Reaper. There have been hundreds of cartoons like that. So in doing this, I'll be nice to you guys, too. I know you're feeling bad. Oh, not so far. Wish me luck. OK, so here, here we had all other cartoons that influenced this. It's the closure fairy, hey, don't I get a receipt and stuff. So I had seen all those cartoons before. Here, look at this cartoon I did in which the Grim Reaper has a caddy. <laughs> if you look at other cartoons, you can see there was a golf Grim Reaper cartoon, and there was this one, a great one, by Sidney Harris, Don't Panic, I'm Just a Sore Throat. It's great cartoons. Now, I didn't, I didn't look at these cartoons or copy them, but they were, in other words, they were part of my domain. And when people enter a domain, and it could be novel writing, it could be song writing, it could be cartooning, I always find, it, I don't want to hear about them if they're so arrogant they don't even know the domain. They just come into it and think, yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Uh, okay, oh, yeah. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, a little bad background. I went to the High School of Music and Art in New York City for art. Uh, it's not, it's not called High School of Music and Art. They thought, it would, they thought a catchier name would be LaGuardia. Oh. <laughs> anyway, it was a really cool school. I went there from 58 to 1960, 1958 to 1962. We uh, legalized marijuana in 59, which I think was amazing. I was like way ahead of everybody else. It was cool. We were, the artists weren't cool. The coolest guys were the musicians, because they were actually getting gigs, and I mean, it was fantastic. Uh, okay, this is, this is amazing. Okay, that's me over there, okay? Robert Mankoff. Okay, that's me in 62. But look at that dude. Yeah. Look at Edward Baruch, the guy with the pipe. Okay, this is 1962. This is a high school photo. He's got a pipe. Man. And so the great thing about the internet and the world we live in is what happened to Edward Baruch? He became the dean of American Pipe. Oh. Just, and I look back, I think, if, if only I had that photo, oh. I could have been the dean of American Pipe Design, but I didn't. I, I, was, I, went to, I went to Syracuse University where I majored in hair. Oh. <laughs> and, okay, so, 
Uh, and so here's, here's, the, here's the anecdote, a little story that changed my life, I must say. I went to Syracuse University, was a terrible student, and, and this is difficult because I'm teaching a class down at Swarthmore in the psychology of humor where I had to tell kids to study and everything, and now I'm, I'm just the wicked world's worst student. Uh, I didn't go to classes at all. I mean, literally, I mean, you'd go to the first class and then another class. So here's the thing sort of changed my life. So, uh, I go to the sociology class, they say, okay, you know, this is when the exams are going to be, and there's only one exam at the end of the year. And I'm late for the exam, and it's all full, and people are all scribbling their blue books, and, I, and I'm running for my, <laughs> my little thing, start scribbling myself, and the teacher comes and he, he looms over me and says, who the hell are you? <laughs> and I was in there. And I calmly looked up at him and said, you know, I could very well ask you the same thing. <laughs> and that was so great, because that does show you the power of humor, the power to move yourself out, the power to not be scared, the power to, you know, and that's how I feel, that's how I feel, but everybody is, oh, it's going to be, you know, when I was growing up, it's on your permanent record. You know what I mean? And this is going to happen. And so that was actually important for me. Uh, anyway, I, got, I, tried to, I was avoiding the Vietnam War, and I actually, long story in the book also, eventually I got into graduate student in an exper uh, program in experimental college at City University, and I'm actually be teaching in the psychology department. I came, finally came back to it at Swarthmore. Uh, what I did was I put, it was called schedules of reinforcement. You put these helpless animals in these Skinner boxes or Skinner cages, uh, and you did things to them, oops, let me do that, you did things to them that are now outlawed by the Geneva Convention. <laughs> anyway, the, the important thing about it, and it'll probably relevant, is it turns out that when you reward an animal every time for doing something, of course they'll do it, and when you stop, they'll stop. But if you reward them intimately, they become very persistent, very persistent. So maybe you reward them all the time, and then one every, every fourth time, then eighth, and then randomly, and then they sort of become addicted to it. Okay, so that's me. I quit. I quit on the cusp of my PhD, which turned out to be the world's largest cusp. <laughs> uh, my cusp is still extending. Okay, I told my father, "Hey, I'm not going to be. I'm my mother too. I'm not going to be a psychologist. I'm going to be a cartoonist." <laughs> and uh, my father paused and looked at me and said. You know, they already have people who do that. <laughs> I said, but one of them might die. <laughs> anyway, I did sell some cartoons. This is the first cartoon I ever sold, which is the Saturday Review, 74. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, no shorthand. <laughs> Here's another cartoon I sold, the Saturday Review. Please don't tell the, <laughs> please tell the king I remember the punchline. <laughs> But, gee, this is what revealed. I wasn't selling to the New Yorker, I was selling here, but very intermittently, I was getting hooked. Because honestly, when, okay, you're at, you quit graduate school, you say you're gonna be a cartoonist, like you say in anything like this, and now you sort of succeed, right? You got published, so, I mean, that's a rush. You know what I mean? It's some sort of, even my parents, like, oh, well, you know, it's, you're not making it's 100 bucks, but you're not making any money, but still it's something. And it's addictive because it's like a gambling schedule. It's random. You never know when you do this stuff, when you put it out there, creator or something. But I am, can't sell to the New Yorker between 74 and 77 when I finally sold. Maybe 1,000 cartoons, 2,000, I honestly don't know. Constant rejection. But eventually, this slip in, in June 20th, 1977, changed to this. <laughs> no, that's not true. That's not true. That's not the New Yorker. That's not New Yorker humor. But that's certainly, uh, that's certainly what I felt. Okay, this is the contract I got from the New Yorker. Now, here's what's interesting about this. I blurred out the part about the drug, the women, the whatever. <laughs> but nowhere in the entire contract does it mention the word cartoons. Idea drawing. Idea drawing. So there's, there's, there's nothing about it, about it. And in a way, that's the essence of the New Yorker cartoon. There's an idea. It's, now, it can be silly, it can be absurd, it can be philosophical, it can be satirical, it can be something you don't get, but you feel there is something to get. 
Uh, this is a little wonky, but this is sort of a little diagram. Every, every, everything I told you, all the jokes have a setup, okay, and the setup create, you know, I'm, I'm 70, the good news is, and then the bad news, and then this cognitive work you have to do with stick everywhere but where I want to be. And the wonderful thing about humor is you have to piece all that together, in, and, it has, and it has to happen in less than half a second. In fact, it's nice when it almost gets to that half second part, and it kicks in. Sometimes you get even more juice from it. But if it goes too long, where all of a sudden you say, oh yeah, <laughs> then there's no laugh. So here, like here, the setup, Hamlet's Duper, punchline, and then you've got to do that cognitive work. You've got to know about it. OK, I'm, I'm going to make a real simple way about funny, almost, it's almost the simplest. That right, right, what's normal isn't funny. Now, OK, so right, a guy's in the chair isn't funny. That wrong is a little, it's, it's marginally funnier. I think everybody can agree that that is funnier than that. There's no real joke. I mean, there are whole theories of benign violations, things where, you know, just wrong, I mean, that's all that's happening on America's Funniest Home Videos, right, is wrong. But, and, you know, and then all of a sudden the shock. So right, wrong, to make it funny, you have to have sort of what it is, what a, a, an appropriate incongruity. Okay, budget reclining. <laughs> okay. Now you have a joke. Right, wrong, funny. Okay, right. That's sort of right. That's the water girl. She's got two buckets. Okay, that's wrong. It's weird. You know, someone would see it or a kid or a child. In other words, children will respond just to incongruity and laugh because that's weird. You know, but in a, we have to have an idea, so that's funny. Yeah, right. So now you're putting something together. In a way, the New Yorker cartoons tie, tie one hand behind their back, maybe even two hands and a foot. <laughs> because the, the real way most people are in our culture now <laughs> goes is it, it primarily through transgression. You understand, pretty much, you can make someone laugh. And that's really a very primitive impulse, and you're shocked. And then you realize you're not going to get hurt. All slapstick is based on it, but even using curse words, even saying fuck, right there. So one of the things, if you want to know why in stand-up comedy people are, are doing this this much, is even that, when I curse, when I say words like that, your brain responds to it as a threat. But it's a threat that me it doesn't mean anything. So right there, that's what happens in stand-up. And the New Yorker would take in all of that away. And I like it. That's, that, it's not like I, I can't appreciate the other parts of you, but that, that's sort of our game. Okay, so that's right for the lemmings. I guess bad for them, they fall off the cliff. That's wrong, <laughs> you know, and that's sort of funny, what lemmings believe. <laughs> but more broadly, when I do a cartoon like that, to me, it has a, a, a meaning. It's not just a joke. It's a meaning about belief, belief in general. And so it's not really about lemmings. In fact, no, any time you laugh at anything that an animal is doing, it's not about animals. It's about people, right? And so here, this is about belief. And for me, it's sort of about religious belief where, you know, there are all these incredible religious fights about who has the best imaginary friend. <laughs> okay, so, I, so in, the, in the book it's dedicated to everyone's ever done a cartoon for the New Yorker, anyone who ever will, uh, and now uh, I'm, you know, that was me. Uh, in 1997 there was a, 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 t uh, a nightline about me in the New Yorker cartoons, that's where I became cartoon editor, and here's a tiny little video about that. Let's see if I have to press it. That's it. Okay. He is such a passionate nurturer of the art of cartooning. Bob, we salute you and we salute all of you here today. Nineteen ninety seven. In the New Yorker history, it's published fifty eight thousand cartoons. Eighty thousand. Fifty eight thousand cartoons which I have right here on this 
this, which is virtual. Yeah. Wow. Back up. Okay. So I talk about that in the, in the book, you know, because that, that's when I became cartoon editor 19 years ago. Tina Brown made me a uh, cartoon editor. And then I'll show another little video of this was, there was a, there was an HBO documentary, but last year also there was a 60 Minutes on me and the New Yorker cartoons. And one of the things that's interesting when you look at it, and I'll talk a little bit, is sort of the transformation to a new and younger generation of cartoonists. So this is what goes on. Every, every Tuesday there's an open call at the New Yorker, which means anybody can show a cartoon. Hey, how are you? Paul, Robert, well, I suppose you came in here to show me cartoons. Every Wednesday, a nervous band of ink-stained wretches gathers at Bob Mankoff's office. Let's see what you got here. Okay. Hoping against hope to sell him a cartoon. As for what they're paid, no one's talking. How many have been accepted, I really don't know. There's the grizzled veteran Sam Gross, who figures he's submitted 30,000 cartoons, <laughs> give or take. 30,000? Yeah. Many consider this his masterpiece. A dog at Heaven's Gate asking, is there any chance of getting my testicles back? Sam has always pushed the envelope things that you couldn't quite do. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. There's always a little preliminary chit-chat. How you been? Uh, all right. Farley. Farley Katz specializes in the far out in both cartoons and facial hair. So what's going on with that mustache? Are you still entering in the contest? No, I retired from the circuit. This is all like a recreational mustache. <laughs> okay. And then Mankoff speed reads the rough sketches. This is just too awkward a drawing. Most get rejected. He's seen the idea in one form or another before. You know, like, you know whenever they open your bag at an airport? Carolina Johnson has an airport security cartoon with the TSA guy saying, you can pack this back up now. <laughs> Emily Flake has a joke featuring both King Kong and Godzilla. The two heavy hitters in right. the monster world. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that. Maybe it's just the day for facial hair, but Joe's data seems to be a contender with a Tarzan cartoon. The apes are saying, we found you and raised you as one of us. So we were just wondering, at what point did you learn to shave? I've <laughs> <laughs> researched this. No iteration of Tarzan in literature, comic books, and movies in which he has facial hair. It makes no sense. Right. <laughs> this, is like this, stuff. Um, this is just stage one, fitting out the candidates to take to the magazine's editor. This is a little bit too straightforward. He's largely gone committal. Pleasant, but blunt. It won't look right in our magazine. But a drawing simply isn't good enough. We're not that impressed. Okay, uh, net. It doesn't have enough charm. So that's what happens every Tuesday. One of the things, if, if you watch the HBO documentary, you'll see there's a transition to a whole new generation. People in their 20s and 30s. A lot more women doing it now. We'll make it a big outreach for, like everybody else, the diversity, minority communities, how to do this. It's not easy, you know, the, the problem society has with diversity is a huge uh, economic and sociological problem that, you know, is difficult to address, you know, just, you know, you can address it cosmetically in that, you know, now, for example, when we have groups, of, it, see, it's interesting, when I first did cartoons in New York, if there was a boardroom meeting, there wouldn't be any women in it. And if you put a woman in it, it would, like, seem strange to people. Now it would seem strange if there wasn't a woman in a boardroom meeting. So originally we started saying, okay, let's just diversify what the people look like in the cartoons, that you can have black people in the cartoons and it's not about race. But the, the, the more difficult problem is actually getting people and cartoonists to do it. And there are a lot of convenient and, and even legit, even valid excuses that you need to ignore <laughs> to try to get something done. You know what I mean? You have to try to inconvenience yourself. So we're going out to school, so we're trying to do a lot of things in our small way, in our tiny little you know, part of the universe to uh, change this. Now, most of the cartoons actually don't come in on Tuesday this way because the cartoonists are all over the United States and some of them are even overseas. And so I get them electronically and then sometimes I just deal with them electronically. What I'll do is I'll look at the PDFs and I'll select and then I'll print out because in the end, when I go to the meeting with David Remnant, it, frankly, pe pieces of paper are a lot easier to flip through. Uh, 
<laughs> so there's no laugh meter. Uh, and the fact is, I don't laugh at all because any evaluation of humor, evaluation of an aesthetic is not the enjoyment of the aesthetic. Okay, it's judgment. Believe me, if you went behind the scenes of the Colbert Show or Jimmy Fallon or anything, you wouldn't see them yucking it up. You'd see them saying, no, change this, no, this isn't working. That, that's just the nature of it. Now, the, the, here's a, here's, uh, this is uh, William Hogarth's The Laughing Audience done in like the 17th century. Everybody's laughing except that guy. That guy is the critic. <laughs> and that would be the true. A critic of a play or anything or anything is actually never enjoying it. It doesn't mean actually that he's disliking it, it's just he's evaluating it. My problem, any problem when you're confronted with large material thing is that you don't become that person. It's easy to become, and it's easy to, 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 to forget the audience and just start to think about what I like. And what will happen naturally is that you will, your natural tendency will become fussier and fussier and to dislike more and more, as, especially as you have a huge amount. So I really try to fight against that or think, okay, this is what I'm interested in, but also knowing, and part of, partly actually it helps me to be out and interact with what, what an audience will like who hasn't just seen a thousand cartoons. Uh, one of the ways to look at humor is I don't look at it monolithically. This is this little incongruity graph. So, for instance, when you look at a cartoon like the TSA guy says, pack it all up, that's a cartoon observational about the real world. In some ways, it's not a gag, so in some ways, a, a gag is just meant to be funny. So that a cartoon is within the realm of reality like this. My boss is always telling me what to do. That's like the, that's like the, bit, the idiotic bitching complaint. Yeah, that, he's the boss, you're, she's the boss, you're the employee. But that, that's a quip, that's true, you can imagine that actually happening. This cartoon in which the Leo Cullum cartoon is saying, very impressive, I'd like to find 5,000 more like you where a cowboy is talking to a cow. <laughs> it, that doesn't mean anything, really. It doesn't mean anything, it's just a joke. And then there's a whole range of absurd humor in which, in fact, there's nothing to get. It's either you like weirdness or you don't. Okay, so this, this, this cartoon by Jack Ziegler, which says, David Hopkins, didn't you get yesterday's memo? And what is the memo? They're all in zoot suits playing saxophone. <laughs> It'd be the difference between, on the extreme, liking something corny and liking Monty Python. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, we're just liking silly for the sake of silly. And, and that actually, as I teach the class, it's one thing to do with a lot of personality characteristics. For example, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, you can like a sort of corny joke, but if, but if everything that is absurd says, it's what you say, that's crap. I don't get it. What the fuck is that? If you say that, you're probably a conservative, except you didn't, <laughs> except you didn't use the word <laughs> Okay, so that's, so when I'm looking at the cartoons, I'm trying to look at them in categories, not the apples, the oranges, the kiwis, or whatever. Okay, then I gotta go quick. Okay, my rules for judgment. Originality is overrated. Uh, in terms of cartoons. That's the first cartoon that ever appeared in the New Yorker magazine on a desert island. Okay, I won't even go through the whole thing. Okay, the, then the cartoons can start to mean different things over time. So in, in 1951, it'll be uh, about sex. Gosh, Mr. Maxwell, with all those other girls on the boat, I never thought you'd give me a tumble. And then here, it's an immigration policy. Code. Okay, my point here about originality being overrated is that people like novelty but within a cocoon of familiarity. All popular culture is based on a template of it's familiar. I sort of heard that song before, but it's a little new. And all jokes are like that too. If you do an experiment where you have jokes and you, and you right before the punchline you cut it off, you ask one group of people to predict the punchline and another group of people to you know, rate the punchline. In general, people like the most predictable punchline. They like, they, like the more, they like the thing they almost could have thought. Not all, okay? Okay, so the other thing is it's been done, which means that that cartoon let me through, through on the victim. So when David Cypress submitted this cartoon, I said, David, I've done this. But the way we do it is we, we, we Whenever the cartoons that we buy at the meeting, we compare or we, 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 our database, we search to see if the cartoons have ever been done before against all 80,000 cartoons. Wow. 
also against everything that we can on the internet. Almost, now, almost anything that's a word play, like let's say you have the Captain Ahab, right? And you think of a cartoon, and often cartoonists think of it as, as Captain Rehab, and then you, know, you figure out, okay? <laughs> you know that will be done. You know anything in the word flip. And I'm not gonna talk about the caption contest, but the caption contest, which I created and run at the back of the thing is, it is almost impossible to think of a unique, funny caption. The captions come in as clusters. Almost all captions have you know, repetition. So that, in a way, that makes it harder and harder when we do our job here to not duplicate things. Okay, so these are similar cartoons submitted in the same week. You know, where's Waldo cartoons? So, 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 so not only, not only uh, you know, do we check, but I see this phenomenon up close and that cartoonists will do in the same week. So it's like the zeitgeist. Once like Waldo gets into like the cartoon mindset, then there'll be all these duplicates. Well, you play favorites as in favorite cartoonists. So there's no doubt there's a bias towards the fav our favorite cartoonists because there's a reason they become favorites. <laughs> also because the way humor works is there's a, con there's a conditioning response. Whatever comedian you like, because that comedian, he or she, has been funny before, you're actually going to find the things they say funnier, uh, uh, even though objectively, if someone else told the same joke, you wouldn't. Well, I, on a practical level, that exists. I can't ignore that. I can't actually say, oh, I have this objective comedy meter, <laughs> and this is as funny as that. I say, no, you like Roz Trask. So when Roz Trask does insomnia jeopardy, <laughs> Okay, now why Roz is, so I think the little distinct thing about Roz here is a lot of people could do this. She, 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 the one she picks, ways in which people have wronged me, strange noises, diseases I probably have, money troubles, what did I say, do that. But the nice one is ideas for a screenplay. Because all of these, because, uh, because a less original mind would make it all bad things. Do you know what I mean? Ideas for a screenplay all of a sudden, you know, going into that. Drew Dernovich did this where whenever I can't sleep, I write down the, the things that are bothering me. Uh, I, did, I did this. I can't sleep. I've got this incredible craving for capital. Everybody has a different day, Donnie. Rule four. Okay, you play favorites, but not so much that nobody else gets to play. Okay, this is one of our new cartoons explaining an idea. A cartoon that was popular uh, made the rounds in Facebook and, and it seems to have struck a chord with people, which was the, this one of uh, a guy wearing the dog and cone around his neck and, and saying, the way it seems to have started was I was in an airport at one point and wrote down an idea for meditation with a shock collar. And so so that, that was the first time that I had the idea of crossing some sort of pet training device with, 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 with humans and with attention, I guess. After the, the shock collar idea sort of worked its way through my brain for a while, and I started playing around with the idea of the RCA Victor dog who sits next to the gramophone. I, I was using the cone of the, of the gramophone as a cone around his neck. The only thing I came up with is he's saying to another Dalmatian, don't ask. So uh, probably better that you don't either. The next page is a, a dog wearing a lampshade around his neck, and the other dog is saying, oh, never, you crazy party animal. It was a joke in my field when I grew up that a party animal always wears the uh, lampshade on his head. Then, then that was all, nothing else in the, in the rest of this book, nothing else came of that until uh, a few weeks later it just pops up out of nowhere. I guess I didn't think about dogs because I have a guy using a remote to turn a dog on and off or to make a dog sit and it says dogmatic. And then out of that just suddenly I uh, had it. It's supposed to keep me from compulsively checking my phone. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it also, I was banging on with the idea, seeing where I could go with it. And unfortunately, it also says, licking my scab and licking my butthole. I think, so you can edit that out. <laughs> and there, there it is, he's at a party. He has the cone around his neck. He's talking to a woman. That was basically the idea. And it looks like it just appeared out of nowhere, but I think that it, that it was all uh, sort of sifting and, through my brain. So out of each notebook, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll have three or four cartoons out of each notebook and sometimes there will be notebooks that are just vast, barren deserts of, of, of terrible ideas that may someday become better ideas.
So that, that's the process. And one of the things is, I'll say the difference between an amateur and a professional is an amateur really likes everything they do. <laughs> uh, okay, the new news is good news. So this topical stuff, when, when this crazy seven minute workout came on, you know, this is, my take on this is this is how to hurt yourself fast. <laughs> Ridiculous. But Roz did this cartoon, this topical cartoon, the seven second one workout. Uh, uh, rule six, edit. This, this guy, Bob Eckstein, cartoon, said this is an alien spelling bee. I said, it doesn't really look like it. You know, I said, let's just, let, let's just exaggerate that so that we, it looks more like an alien spelling bee. So I do a lot of this little tweaking and editing. Sometimes I give people ideas. Okay, one of the things is that uh, uh, the New Yorker is very empathetic and sensitive and liberal, and people are very easily offended. Okay, so you have to be very careful. So here, when, when, when Cecil the Lion was killed, this guy Cameron Hapfies, who does an online cartoon, did this. You know, because the, the official wanted the guy prosecuted. And I said, you know what? That's going to be a little too, too, too much. I got in right now? I'm from New York. You're going to come up. You talking to me? <laughs> you talking to me? All right. Anyway, so we got to do that. Okay, I'll end in a minute. I made it this to make it easier. Location, location, location. That means it's the New Yorker. We gotta be careful. People are offended easily. <laughs> this guy told me to drop, uh, making fun of white males, aha, uh -huh, the joke told me to drop dead. Okay, this cartoon, some people were offended by. I'm moving, moving, moving. Okay, look at this cartoon. I've only been gluten-free for a week, but I'm already annoying. <laughs> Here's this person, the whole letter, telling you, oh, I'm suffering from celiac disease. And I say, this woman said, walk a mile in our shoes. That's a good idea. You'd be a mile away from her. You'd have her shoes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip through all this stuff, which is how we dealt with 9-11. I know. It's in, the, it's in the book. It's in the book. It's in the book. Okay. Okay, a Danish cartoon controversy. We can talk about that. Charlie Hebdo, if you want to ask me questions. This is the one that we put in the New Yorker. Please enjoy this culturally, ethnically, religious, and politically correct cartoon. Thank you. Okay, I'm scared. Oh, this was great. This is great. That guy made you miss this. Okay. 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 I'm going to see now. They'll kill. They're going to rip you to shreds now. That's right. He's going to flee. Okay. Sometimes people are not offended by the cartoons, but they don't get them. The famous episode written by a New Yorker cartoonist, which I'm going to end with. This cartoon in the New Yorker. I don't get this. Me neither. And you're on the fringe of the humor business. <laughs> hey, George, look at this. That's cute. You get it? No, never mind. <laughs> So one thing I want to leave you with is a thought here. Oh, is, that, is there anything there? Oh, that's not working. What's happening? Anyway, uh, that turns out, unfortunately, to be the end of my talk. Aww. Thank you. So I guess I'm going to sign the book now. There was going to be a Q&A, but you can, you can test me the questions over the next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>